Hello, everyone. I am here with Krishna Chalamasandra, Senior Director, Security and Compliance Customer Trust at Salesforce. Einstein GPT is now, of course, GA with some of its features and probably some of you watching have heard about the Einstein GPT trust layer. So Krishna, tell us, how does this trust layer work for Einstein GPT? Basically, this is what our overall architecture for uh, uh, all the Einstein GPT use cases. As you can see, the outer blue box, right? Light blue box is our Salesforce trust boundary. Okay. Right? And within that is where we have our Einstein GPT trust layer. And as we can see, there are multiple uh, phases of uh, functionality. I see there's something that happens before prompt masking called prompt defense. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So this is where uh, basically once we retrieve the necessary data required from our customer orgs or the uh, different sources from where customer data is stored, the dynamic knowledge grounding happens to add the context to the prompt and prompt part of this prompt defense, we will go into identify what are the sensitive information below that belongs to customer. And that is what will get masked uh, part of prompt masking. Excellent. Okay. So, and then how do you detect what is PII or what is sensitive? Is that, do we look at the metadata tags or is there, what's the, that uh, mechanism? We have mechanisms like leveraging our NLP models. We will be able to identify parameters and these parameters will be replaced by some generic alpha numeric tokens. Mm -hmm. So that way, part of uh, sending the prompt to a third party uh, LLM provider like OpenAI, Open we will not be sending this data. Got it. And then when it comes back, that's the demasking where we have the token and figure out wh what the token actually represented and essentially like rehydrate the data. Is that is that what's happening there? You, you said it right. Yeah. Part of the post-processing, once we get back the generated response, we will do the reverse operation, do the reverse masking of replacing those alphanumeric tokens with the actual value which we had replaced earlier. So that way now the response within the trust boundary has all the context and all the different PII information required for our customers. Excellent. And you touched on this already, talking about going to open AI, but Let's focus in more on zero retention. So I see that happens. It looks like it's right on the trust boundary. So what's happening there? Excellent. Yeah, that's an excellent observation. So part of zero trust uh, or zero retention, uh, what we are trying to do is initially, like to start with, we have partnership with OpenAI and we will be leveraging their chat GPT 3.x LLM models. Mm -hmm. For most of the Einstein GPT use cases, and, and today is the right timing because we got three of our Einstein GPT use cases going live, right? The announcement was made this morning. And big day. <laughs> yeah, it's a really a big day. Yep. So coming back to this partnership with OpenAI, we are not just integrating to their LLM models and getting the response generated. We were able to go one step beyond in getting a legal contractual agreement with them that the prompts which will be sending to their LLM models will not be stored within okay. their open AI or it will not be used for training their models or they will not be using our prompts in part of their service logs for monitoring. So it is literally zero retention and also our GRC team has done a fantastic job in doing the assessment of OpenAI infrastructure. And also we have a, a verifiable evidence that shows OpenAI is not storing any of our prompts. Okay. And that we're is, going, that's that's huge. So, Ed, and I was curious how that works. So it's actually a legal agreement. And then... We're, we're, are we leveraging their public APIs or is there a special API that we're leveraging as a part of that legal agreement? That's another excellent question. So we have our own instance in the sense org, Salesforce org of OpenAI. 
with that logical segregation of all of our prompt, we are using those APIs, like a proper authentication to say open AI uh, APIs and all our prompts gets executed in that logical segregation uh, that has been uh, allocated for uh, uh, Salesforce. Got it. On the open API infrastructure, there's a logical org essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So let's, so that's open API, which again, if I can, now I understand that shared trust is that legal agreement that we have for the zero retention. They're not retaining any of our prompts, even though the information has already been masked. We don't want to know what questions they're asking. We're, we're asking of our sensitive customer data anyway. Um, but let's back, go back into the Salesforce trust boundary and talk about the Salesforce hosted LLMs. For one of the specific Einstein GPT use case called Apex GPT, mm-hmm. which can generate Apex code or even it can generate test classes for our customers. That use case use case uses our in-house built LLM models called CodeGen. It yes, is completely code built. Yeah, completely built by Salesforce and Apex GPT uses that uh, LLM model. Beyond that, we also have. I have a partnership with Cohere and Anthropic. Mm-hmm. And here it's a special uh, partnership where they will be holding their instances on top of Salesforce platform or the infrastructure. So that way, the whole instance itself is part of the Salesforce trust boundary now. From day one, when we started thinking about uh, uh, how we can offer these Einstein GPT use cases for our customers, we, we chose to go with the open model architecture. What that means is we don't want to lock down our customers with only Salesforce provided LLMs. And generative AI is one of the fastest, like rapidly growing technology ever in the, tech, in, in the industry, right? In the technology space. And we wanted to provide flexibility for our customers to use best in breed LLM models that fits their Einstein GPT use cases. And that's where now, as you can see with OpenAI, which is the one of the leader in LLM provided we have partnered with and Cohere, Anthropic have their own strengths with, with their models, which we'll be leveraging. And also we are kind of extending this uh, shared trust for our customer built LLMs as well. So yeah. that way it's a open model platform using that LLM gateway, the LLM gateway layer, as you see here in this block diagram, does the magic and provides the flexibility for our customers. Got it. And then the shared trust would come with the big bring your own model because that's the model that our, that's a customer built model. Is that correct? So the trust is almost implicit because it's something that they are, they're maybe hosting themselves or they're hosting on another trusted partner, but that they've developed. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. So bring your own model part of the shared trust will has to kind of adhere to all the security and privacy requirements we'll have. And with bring your own models, customers will be developing their models, their own models, and they will be training their own models. They are responsible for all that. And if they have one, always there is an option to integrate with our platform and use it for their uh, use cases. That makes sense. Okay. So we talked about, I I love focusing on the zero attention that cleared up a lot of questions I had. And now let's move to toxicity detection. And let's dig into a little bit more about how that actually works. Excellent. Yep. So we have, as you can see here, even during the pre-processing, even the prompts we generate by doing knowledge grounding and after masking all the sensitive information, we do the toxicity detection on the prompts as well. Right, so that way, this will take care of making sure our prompts have the necessary hygiene required. There is no discrimination or some bias built into the prompt itself, right? So this is something like as part of our uh, best practices in coding, like doing the input validation and output validation, right? So prompts will go through this toxicity validation, toxicity detection, and once the generated response comes back, we again do toxicity detection on the response generated. So what actually we do here is, as we all know, Salesforce is not new to AI ML world. 
Right. We were providing these services more than a decade back. And we had our own NLP sentiment analysis and language models, right? With uh, By acquiring MetaMind, Einstein.ai, and the team over, over the time, they have built a lot of these models. Those are some of the models which will come into play here in going through analyzing these prompts or the response to make sure they will be able to identify the sentiment, right? And yeah. based on the sentiment analysis and other factors we consider, we'll be able to detect if there is any bias, discrimination, or hallucination, and we'll be able to rectify those during these phases. Got it. And then is that surface to the user? So will I, as a customer, be able to see that something might be toxic or something might be a hallucination? Or is that being screened out and the user isn't even seeing it? It's the later one. The so later basically, one. it all happens in the back and under the hood and very transparent for the users. And users will see the final crafted, uh, relevant, contextual generated response. Got it. Got it. And then talking about feedback. So what is the mechanism? We've pro- A lot of us have probably played around with chat GPT. We know that there's, you know, you can thumbs up or thumbs down the response. What does the feedback loop look like? from a, an Einstein GPT perspective. Yes. So this is another uh, very important uh, uh, phase uh, where we're collecting the feedback from the users is uh, very vital, right? So that way we can get to know how these models are performing, right? How much satisfaction these responses, generated responses are providing. So one of the basic feedback mechanism will be thumbs up, thumbs down, similar to what chat GPT has today. So our users will have that. And also there are plans to kind of track the behavior in the sense, if the user modifies the final response, how much modification is going on, right? So since it's all running within our platform, right. we can get to kind of analyze and detect all of these. And some of these feedbacks will come into this feedback framework and we'll be using this for some of our models for fine tuning them. For example, Apex GPT, based on the quality of code it is generating, quality of test cases it is generating, we collect the feedback from our users and we'll be able to fine tune those. And and as we know, these LLM models use billions and trillions of parameters and these feedback will be leveraged to kind of identify those parameters, what we can use for fine tuning them for better performance and accuracy. Krishna, what are you most excited about when it comes to all of this new technology? Yeah. And before I go there, yeah. I would like to thank and appreciate our engineering team, product yes. team, and all the teams involved in building these things. Going from idea to production within three months is is uh, like easier said than done. Oh my goodness. Right? Yes. So fantastic job. There is a lot of excitement in the field. And with the model we have for Einstein GPT, every month we will be releasing new GPT uh, services as we move forward. So, okay, one last question before I let you go, Krishna. Um, What advice do you have for Salesforce architects who are working with our customers to implement this new technology? One advice for our architect, this domain is changing every day, right? A lot of new, new things coming, a lot of different cases, uh, use cases available. So what I w- it, it's not easy to catch up and be on top of everything. So uh, what I would recommend is like networking is the net worth. Oh, I love that. Well, thank you so much for your time, Krishna. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Have a great rollout day of Einstein GPT. Enjoy the rest of your day. And um, we hope to see all of you back here very soon. 